Many thanks for your um, interest in coming so early. Um, my name is Gosar Saraf. I'm chief executive of um, Arvis Group. It gives me great pleasure to be co-presenting uh, with one of the best multi-channel leaders um, <coughs> that I had the pleasure to work with for the past 10 years, Steve Robinson. Um, I'll just quickly introduce um, um, the company and myself, and then I'll ask Steve to, um, to do the same. Um, Arvis Group is a multi-channel um, consulting and solution provider, founded in the UK in 1994, uh, moved into Asia, first in um, Malaysia, opened office in Kuala Lumpur 2007, in Beijing 2012, and Singapore earlier this year. Um, we engage um, our clients using combination of strategic consulting and uh, solution, um, our own uh, technology. Um, and, uh, I've been one of, uh, we've been working with Tesco.com since their inception in 1996. I was one of seven people at the start of Tesco.com. And for the following 18 years, we've basically gone through a journey from um, four orders on the first night of trading in November 96. Today, we support 14,000 orders per hour, uh, 300 pounds, first night of trading, and today, 3.3 uh, billion pounds and presence in 10 countries. So we are present in four countries. Our solutions run in 20 countries. Typically, we would create solutions in the UK, and then they would be rolled out worldwide, such as Tesco and Carrefour Warehouse. In addition to my uh, responsibilities in running <coughs> Ives Group, I'm also a visiting professor in uh, Peking University in China, and I lecture to their international MBA program. Um, I have a two-day course, Creating Customer-Centric Omnichannel Organizations. So, would like to introduce Steve, Steve Robinson. I'm Steve Robinson. I'm the CEO of a business called uh, Ashika, which is a home and lifestyle private members uh, site in the UK. Um, I've been working in and around multi-channel e-commerce and omni-channel for about 14 years now. So I was finance director at Argos, who were the sort of trailblazers really of, of multi-channel. <clears throat> I set Tesco Direct up for Tesco. Um, I was CEO of a business uh, called M&M Direct, where we doubled profits in three years. Um, spent a little time at uh, B&Q as their customer director uh, before becoming CEO of, uh, of Ashika. There's something new to discover for the home and garden every day at ashika.com. Great brands at amazing prices. Available anywhere you can get online. Log on to ashika.com now and discover more. So today we're going to talk to you about extending your business models leveraging your investment and um, being inventive in terms of how you engage the market and going from one to seven business models. This presentation um, will give you our views in terms of what's happening in the market, the trends, uh, but we will go beyond that. So we will talk about practical case studies, practical examples. The keyword yesterday, um, coin time and time again was disruption. Uh, between us, we have many examples of various um, disruptive systems, disruptive solutions that we've been um, developing for the past uh, 20 years. So this is not just about multi-channel, omni-channel, cross-channel. It's actually about customer centricity. So the focus is going to be about um, how you know, would you go about creating customer-centric organizations and taking advantage of, um, of market trends. So this is covering 20 years, experience in multi-channel. Um, between us, as you can see, we have um, uh, big names in terms of giving stories from the, the Tesco world, um, Argos, Carver Warehouse, m and and Ashika. Um, so we're going to um, also outline models, um, guidelines, uh, best practice processes. So we want, our intention is to make this as a practical. So this is the picture of um, multi-channel, um, starting with the most important channel, um, bricks and mortar. Sometimes this gets missed. Now, to, demystif to begin with, I want to demystify a few myths. This, we're not talking about a business on the side. And we're not talking about um, a business that's based on technology. This is the business. And um, at the heart of the business, you have 
all these channels, all these touch points that you are using as a brand owner or as a retailer to connect to consumers. So a channel has two definitions, a touch point as far as consumers are concerned and a revenue stream as far as retailers are concerned. And if you're not already um, you know, in place in terms of connecting these channels, communicating with your customers, then obviously you know, th th there is a gap, there is a missed opportunity. So what we are gonna talk about is beyond this. So th this will be assumed as the basic, that's the expectation of customers. But where else you're able to expand the business? Steve, do you wanna comment? Yeah, I mean, uh, the only thing I'd add is, um, I, there's a lot of language around this, this subject matter, multi-channel, omni-channel. Um, even, even back sort of 14 years ago, we were talking about complementary channels, alternative channels. The, the language has changed a lot over the years. For me, it's always just been about choice. So customers will choose how they want to interact with you. And I think that the, the power has shifted from, from the retailers that used to pretty much build a, build a store and they will come sort of mentality to customers deciding which touch points they want to use with you and also the combination of those touch points. So you might find them using all of these or just a couple of combinations of these. You won't be able to second guess which ones they're going to use. It'll be down to personal preference. So for me, omni-channel is just about choice. And, and the shift of power towards consumers away from retailers. This sort of picture would have been interesting, say, a year ago or two years ago. But right now, the market has moved. Now it's all about differentiation, innovation, differentiation um, to create your niche, to stand out in the market, to be clear about your value proposition. Innovation is about gaining agility, reduction of time to market, ability to act quickly, and then propagation is all about scale. How do you scale your business to achieve your targets, achieve your business objectives? These are some um, examples of um, businesses, of retailers, that had um, challenges in achieving differentiation, innovation, propagation. Um, phones for you, second largest mobile retailer in the UK, once EE and Vodafone um, didn't want to continue with, with the contract, they were out of ideas and, um, and, and they lost out. Um, La Senza was squeezed between the partner stores and, and brands and again were unable to, um, um, to, uh, to basically scale their business. Um, Athena were having challenges in moving fast enough, quickly enough, on, on the innovation curve. So these examples of businesses that have struggled to, um, to achieve these goals, achieve these targets. I thought I'd give an example of one that has done that. And uh, I, I think ASOS is a great example of, of a business that's followed this curve. I know at the moment the, the share price is in the doldrums and they've had a couple of profit warnings. And, but, but in terms of its, its journey as a business, they, they worked out back five, six years ago that range was gonna be their differentiating point. And they went around pretty much quadrupling their range over a couple of years. Um, and that's the thing that really set them apart from, from other people. And once they differentiated, they then started to innovate in their service. So they led the way in order as late as 12 o'clock at night and get it the next day. Um, they led the way with some of the, the guys like Shuttle doing same day deliveries in, in the M25. So, so they differentiated, they innovated. And then their, their expansion worldwide is, for me, their, their propagation. So they took what they were doing really well in the UK and they expanded it to other territories. So despite them being uh, struggling a little bit at the moment in terms of profits, I think they're a great example of a, of a business that's managed to, to do that at great speed. So what, what we've done now with the first section of this presentation is to, is to set the argument, the business case for the why. So next, we will talk about the what, i.e. define the business models and, and talk about how you can actually leverage the investment. And then the third and final section, we'll be talking about the how. So starting with the why, moving now to the what, and then finally the how. So in terms of um, the, the what, these are the, the various business models open for you in terms of ability um, to flex your offerings across um, Steve likes to call these super channels, um, or, or business models, if you like, to connect with various types of segments um, that you might already have and then expand into regions and so on. So these business models could be direct 
like B2C, like internationalization. They could also work through partners such as marketplace or affiliates. Um, they could take advantage of um, niche business models such as flash sale, which is what Ashika business is built on, 60 million pound business, and, and Steve will, will talk more, more about this, or shared platform whereby you are providing infrastructure for other brands. So, so or of course, white label. Um, I mean, this is classic example. When Tesco.com wanted to leverage their branding and move from food to non-food, they used white label initially, uh, and that was the, uh, the system predecessor to uh, Tesco Direct, which um, Steve launched in 2006. And under two years, just using white label, Tesco.com with uh, no impact on supply chain. Yeah, I was going to add something on here, which, um, you know, massive believer in terms of strategy that the businesses that are most successful are the ones that take their core assets and then they utilize them in as many ways uh, as possible. Um, I, I've got a very sort of uh, unusual example of that. I used to live in, in Fulham in London and there was a, a, a small bar cafe um, called Crocs on the Fulham Road. And, and I thought it was a dream business because you would have your breakfast in there, your lunch, your dinner. And then in the evening, it became a sort of nightclub late bar that was open till three in the morning. And then people were in there at seven o'clock in the morning again, having their breakfast, having clothes for three hours. And those guys realized that their most expensive investment they've made is the rent on the property. And they leverage that asset um, to, the, to, the, um, to the max. And, and so I, I think that follows in all areas of, of business. And, and I think we're, as, as, uh, as retailers actually, quite obsessed with to see and not obsessed enough about these other um, markets and, uh, and channels. And, and I think if you can take your biggest assets, for me in Ashika, my biggest asset is my range. So we've ranged over 350,000 individual lines in the last 12 months. And my asset is my customer base. So I've got 4 million customers um, who have, who have um, interacted with, with me in the last uh, couple of years. If I can't find other ways other than B2C to leverage that 350,000 range and those 4 million customers, then I'm not doing a good enough job for my shareholders because any one of these other ones um, are going to add incremental uh, revenue to the, to the business. If you get the tech right and you get your platform right, I think you can exploit all, to all of these. I think too uh, often in, in organizations, these are siloed approaches to this with, with um, old tech that's been hanging around for sort of 10, 15 years that makes this very difficult and means you have to throw lots of people and investment at it. I think if you get your tech right, you absolutely, uh, with customer-centric tech, can exploit all of these very cost-effectively. And that's the future of, of, of uh, agile businesses, I think. <laughs> <laughs>